Welcome into episode 363 of the Skate Podcast. I'm Brian D. Felice, joined by Bridget Pru and Scott McLaughlin. Bridget and Scott, I've seen a lot of Halloween movies in my lifetime, but last night in Carolina was probably the scariest one I've seen. So let's Give just me nightmares, cut. Brian. I woke myself oh. up screaming twice in the middle of the night. And Scott said, Was it were you reliving the Bruins penalty kill? And I had to think about it. But uh, yeah, that was really scary, so I'm surprised it wasn't that. It's been scary, guys. It's been scary. I said maybe it was the power play. I don't know. They're both been pretty scary bad. This wasn't even like a good horror movie, though. Like this, yeah. this was just like a like serial killer goes on a murder spree, but there's like no real drama. Like that, there there was no chance of anyone surviving this movie. Like. It was it was clear in the first, you know, 20 minutes that everyone's going to die. Right, right. As the viewers, we just had to wait till the very end now. Yeah, we go stuck the it out. Yep. Yeah, I mean, guys, let's just we'll hop into the opening shift. So obviously, yeah, the Bruins fall to the Hurricanes. There is there is nothing there is nothing good to talk about with this team uh, yet again. And. One thing we didn't talk about last episode as much was the inability to build off of that Toronto win. I mean, since that Toronto win, you think they're going to turn the corner a little bit. And the last two games have just been putrid. Um, and I would say, you know, the entire season so far has been putrid for them in October. So um, why don't we throw it to uh, Scott? Let's throw it to you for the first opening shift. And then Bridget, and then I'll, I'll conclude. Well... We have to have the Jim Montgomery conversation. Um, you know, R Rich Keefe said, uh, Scoops Keefe on Jones and Keefe on Thursday, during during their show on Thursday, that he was hearing that Montgomery was on the hot seat, which I don't think would surprise anyone. Um, I think we all thought he was anyways. Um, and that was before Thursday night, which, as you said, it was just a – Complete disaster in, in every possible way. Um, it, it really, I, I tweeted this and it's like, obviously I'm being, you know, somewhat sarcastic and joking, but it's like, whatever the opposite of a magic touch is, that's what Montgomery seems to have right now. Where it's like, you know, when, when things are going great, like two years ago, it was like everything he touched turned to gold. And now it's like everything he touches just crumbles to dust. Like, he has one good line going in the fourth line. He moves all three members of that line around to try to spark something on other lines with the message being, we want you to keep playing the same way because we want it to rub off on other guys, you know, higher skill guys who aren't playing that way. And then those three guys, Johnny Beecher, Mark Kaslick, and Cole Kepke lead an absolute parade to the penalty box that results in the Bruins just getting ripped open by Carolina. Um, Carolina's first goal is on a delayed penalty call on Beecher. The second is with uh, Kepke in the box. The fourth is with Kastelik in the box. The I think it was the sixth is with Beecher in the box. Like it's it, it's like now you don't even have those guys going. And I, I feel like, look, I don't blame Montgomery for splitting them up and trying what he tried because – this team has been at a point where you have to try everything. Like he has nothing else to do other than to just throw crap at the wall and, and hope it sticks, but it's not N nothing's sticking. Nothing's working. Nothing's sparking this team. Um, and I think it is absolutely fair to wonder when Don Sweeney decides that he needs to be the one to try to spark this team. And there's really only two ways to do that. One is a big trade that catches everyone's attention. And one is, changing the coach. And I think one of those things is easier to do than the other. Yeah. And I mean, I was thinking about it last night at different points in the game, just how, like, I was like, does he even make the flight home after how bad this was? And it, once again, I think I saw you tweet something, Brian, that like, whose fault really is it? Because is it the coach's fault? I don't, I mean, it's obviously some of it's on him, but guys are just not playing the way that they can. Like David Pasternak had another few weird turnovers and just not hustling. And I don't know, I'm not used to seeing him look like that. Just look a little bit like 
lax and turn pucks over and, and ends up, they didn't score on it, but they got, uh, somebody got a, a good chance on Swayman, like a two on one break from it. But it, it was, it, the more you watch it, you're like, okay, well, this is on the players, but clearly some, some of it goes on the coach because the systems aren't working. Like uh, it's a systematic issue when the power play looks that bad every game and he controls the power play and whether or not guys want to buy in, if it's a good system and they're just not buying in, or maybe it's a system that's not working. And then they changed the power play uh, up quite a bit last night against Carolina. And, you know, they did move Charlie McAvoy off the, the top unit and they, they moved Flori and they had Lynn home involved too, but it, it once again still somehow found a way to look pretty much as bad as it did before. They get more five on three opportunities that um, they did, did. Is that when Marshawn scored on one of the five on threes? Like Marshawn got the luckiest bounce of a goal where he shot it off the defenders legging in and like, great. It's a power play goal, but it wasn't the prettiest one. Uh, and anyway, that's not even my opening shift. I was going to say pass. Uh, I don't want to, do I have to, but, uh, I, what I decided on was, uh, which we said before the podcast is something that Bruins players also say to their coaches pass. Do we have to, because do we know, have to, I don't know how to do it. I think I'm not going to do it. Um, it, what I decided on was, um, Jeremy Swayman got yanked last night. Um, and we can get into later after, you know, we go through Brian's opening shift and, um, probably hit Monty first, but uh, how much of that was on what happened in front of him and how much was on maybe bad reads or, or, you know, he doesn't usually give up six goals guys. So, um, you know, I just want to kind of break down where the issues were in front of him and, and maybe some of the issues he had himself. And you see Corpusalo come in and he, he actually, I thought played, pretty decent gives up two but you know only two of eight which is it just felt like it it couldn't get worse and then it continued to like you're like oh it can't possibly get worse they scott you brought this up before we were recording like three goals they gave up three goals in 50 what seconds like 54 seconds or whatever it was 52 seconds yeah. 52 seconds and then in the second period they did the same thing and that's when or they gave up two goals in 40 something seconds and then Swimming gets pulled. Um, and then it's like, okay, well, you you couldn't spark anything by pulling the goalie. You couldn't spark anything by chaining the lines. And it kind of kept leading me back to, like, do you try to spark something if you're Don Sweeney by, by changing coaches? So kind of kept coming back to that. Yeah, yeah. So I think the majority of this episode is going to have to be uh, topics uh, that are – not pleasant to the ear if you're a Bruins player or a Bruins coach. So for that matter, I'll just quickly try to get a little bit of optimism out of the way first and change the pace here. And I'm not saying this is going to work, but what I'm about to suggest is what I would be doing right now if I was a player. And if I was a player on the Bruins right now, my, my mindset would be, thank God, October is over and I would pretend in my mind, I would throw away the four, six and one record. I would throw away to the best of your ability, the dumpster fire that has been the last month of hockey. And let's date back to September too. Cause I thought their training camp sucked. Um, but if I'm a Bruins player, like I just think there's, there's so literally everything. They aren't doing one thing. Well, and they're not even competitive. It's quite frankly embarrassing, which is why if I'm them, is I think you're not a competitive game. <laughs> no, it's one one touchdown away. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, maybe in football. Um, but yeah, it's it's. I just think that the the human psychology can can play such an important factor. Um, you know, in any element of life, but in in this situation in professional sports, I think. The Bruins' psyche is completely damaged right now uh, through October. And I think that if I'm them, I would just man-to-man -man look ourselves in the mirror and just 
flush out that last month and be like, okay, new month, new start. Let's let's get a win in Philadelphia. Feel good about that. Then we have Toronto. We know we can, we we could play well against them, and that's what I'd be doing if I was a player. Um, unfortunately, as a as an analyst and a fan, we all know that their issues run far deeper than probably just a mental clearing. But um, sometimes that is what can be a fix because I've talked about it before. I think their biggest flaw right now is stemming from having no confidence. I think if you could play with some confidence, all the intangible logistical X's and O's that we're talking about that they're not doing right now, I think can start to come naturally. Um, Without confidence, I don't think they're going to get to where they want to get to. So they have to find some way to clear their minds, get one win. I know they did that against Toronto, but whatever they, they they screw that up so uh here we are so that's that's my opening shift and then uh now we can if you guys have any follow-up thoughts great otherwise we can commence the uh the bashing yeah i mean it it all ties together though because it's like yeah the players clearly need some sort of just clean slate mindset and i don't know maybe it's the calendar maybe it's you know obviously if the coach gets fired like that gets everyone's attention and really resets things. Um, Whether whether it produces good results or not, like you find that out after the fact, but um, you know, if it's a trade, like stuff, again, there's different things Don Sweeney can try to do to, to wake this team up. I think Jim Montgomery has tried a lot to wake them up and it's, it's not working. Like again, I know, like, I, I see a lot of everyone ripping Montgomery for always changing the lines. And it's like, well, let's remember, they actually started the year with pretty consistent line combinations. Like, first four games, he basically didn't touch the lines. And all I heard at that time was, how? why does he keep trotting out Morgan Geeky on the second line? Like, why isn't he changing things? Pasenak and Lindholm aren't working. Why isn't he changing things? And it's like, you, you can't, the, the fact is, when everyone's playing poorly, you can't win either way. If you keep things together, you're going to get yelled at for not changing stuff. If you change stuff, you're going to get yelled at for not allowing chemistry to develop. Like, it's it's a lose-lose. And it's it's become that situation because the team, the players, are performing so poorly. And yeah. I, I said it before, like, yeah, like there probably is some system stuff. I, I think it does look like players are overthinking things because they're trying to – it's almost like they're trying to remember where they're supposed to be or where their outlet is supposed to be, where their team yeah, is supposed to be. Yeah, breakouts for sure look really clunky. Yeah, so it's like, okay, that part of it might be coaching because it's not coming second nature to these guys. But the the effort stuff, the, like, the winning battles in front of the net or down low, I mean, that's just willpower. Like, that's just do you want it more than your opponent or not? And the Bruins are losing too many of those to be like, oh, it's just a coaching issue. Like, no, it's it's just it's the entire team through. Yeah, it's an execution issue where you watch it with your own eyes. It's like, okay, well, clearly that's not what you're supposed to do on, you know, carrying the puck into the zone or you you whiff on a shot or like some of it's execution, which can come back down to confidence um, and like feeling like you're you're in control and and whatnot. But like to your point, Scott, about people are going to be mad about changing lines and or like it's it's a double-edged sword well I don't really know what the other option was because you had to change something did I think those lines look like they were set up for success no on paper those lines I was like that's interesting um but he already kind of made the obvious switches around uh earlier in the season and to no avail and so he's like let's go with something completely out there uh new philosophy, try to split up the fourth line, even though they were, they're good together to try to spark other people because they were the the line that had confidence and um, you know, it, it obviously didn't work. And, uh, but you had to, you had to try something like there's, there was no keeping those lines together because then you're definitely going to get fired because it's like, okay, well, you're, you're trying to, to play with something that, you know, hasn't been working very well. You gotta, you gotta do that. So Um, obviously I don't think that putting some of these guys together made a whole lot of sense. Like, 
Marshawn Lindholm Castellic. I was like, I don't know what that is. Also, the the like Jones Coyle Kepke on the fourth line was clearly like a hey Charlie, wake up. Um, you're the fourth line center right now. Like we have a lot of centers, and you're you know maybe trying to get his mind to to wake up or something. But I never thought that that Frederick Pacha Brazo line, which those are all third line guys, even, but I still didn't like the, the look of that line. Um, and then Beecher Zaka Pasternak, I was like, mm, maybe that's okay. But yeah, it's all, it, that doesn't even matter really. It's the fact that they needed a massive shakeup. Um, and I don't think line combinations were what killed them. It was just, you know, bad, bad execution. Uh, shooting themselves in the foot with penalties again, which has been a theme the whole season. Um, there was that one goal that got called back for goalie interference. That was, was probably I mean, brick went off on them, but anyway, uh, uh, I think brick was going off on the Boston Bruins and what he's had to watch for the last month. I think and he I was, think, had that pent up yes. rage towards, you know? Yeah. And then that was just like, okay, we're going to take it out on that ref who, mm-hmm called who's honestly like not, none of us here like that goalie interference call but but i think we all understand uh that this i mean is something... I'll, I'll like i thought in today's nhl it's goalie interference like I, yeah we, we can call it soft or not but it's like i don't know i feel like nine times out of ten that's getting called i i realize well, that's what razor that there's still there's still too much inconsistent inconsistency on goalie interference overall but like you talking about the uh, Kachuk one <laughs> I, I mean, as as soon as I saw it, I was like, "Yeah, that's probably coming back." Like, I I wasn't surprised. Yeah, no, no. Well, I, you see, cro- you see the week before, Kachuk cross check uh, goalies and and you know do whatever, and, and that's nothing. But then you see yeah. like Elias Lindholm, like oh, like pretty much at, right at the top, like not really getting in the way of anything. Like anyway, but the difference is Lindholm's contact is directly before the goal, and Kachuk, as we talked about, and, and you know, it was all done you know, very smartly where it wasn't too far, too close to the goals. But what I meant to say was like, you know, I don't, I don't think we all here like where goalie interference is the threshold has gotten to, right? Like that's, that's what I more so meant, but like, as it pertains to 2024 um, and especially what they're trying to do now with the decisive um, calls and not trying to go to reviews and stuff like Yes, I understood the call last night. I I wasn't even up in arms about it. It was more so just like where where it's gotten to. I think Razor did a really good job uh, explaining it to boss on the broadcast. Cause it obviously like he's the goalie on the broadcast and he's like, he keeps a uh, really close eye on anything goalie related. And I thought he explained it pretty well. Yeah, he did. Um, but yeah, I, I the goalie interference is, is, is nothing that I even really thought about even bringing up on this episode because that's, that was the last thing on my mind. Um, but yeah, I just think that, the the line combinations, yeah, it was definitely a short term thing. Uh, Montgomery did so because he was trying to re- reward some of the fourth line players, quote unquote, um, and also have them rub off on some of the other players. But look, guys, at the end of the day, there is no there are no line combinations and there's no X's and O's in my opinion that are the solution to what we're seeing on the ice to me it's it's far more deep rooted than than anything like that because there's definitely moves that can be made for example the power play structurally strategically sucks coaching wise the pk has sucked um but joe sacco has historically done a good job on the pk so i'm going to leave that alone for a second maybe that's just bad, bad execution by the players five on five i i don't I don't like their their four check. It's very I don't I think they run they run a one three one. To me, that's not enough pressure on the puck retriever. So, you know, I, I I've never liked a one three one. It's it's kind of it's kind of like a trap type four check to me. And I don't like it because players just, you know, they don't really give the puck away like that. But regardless, for me guys, there's just something off that has nothing to do with 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 this stuff. And I I Scott, you're at practice more often than not. Um, Bridget, I don't, I don't know how often you get there. I've been going to practice more, um, more often than not this year. And I wish I lived closer. 
Yeah, well, the fact that I'm five minutes from the rink helps. <laughs> yeah, I it, I'm normally about fifty minutes from the rink, but because practice is in the morning, it's two hours because of right. rush hour traffic. So if I could teleport there, I'd be there every every day. Yeah, that's right. That's why you get to live north of the city. Like I, I traffic's cleared up by the time I go to. Brian, you right. got another room in your apartment. You got a closet. I could like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm in the spare bedroom right now. Um. Okay. Well, oh, it's, it's what we're home office. No more. <laughs> there you go. Um, Scott, we, there's a basement too. It's a little creepy though. It could be a couple <laughs> spiders. So, um, but in any event, I, I bring up practice because, I, and Bridget, you brought up my tweet last night about about how Monty's not the main issue, and he's not. We can get into that later. I think he's going to go from potentially lame duck coach to scapegoat, but in practice, I, I haven't. I haven't loved the practices. I haven't loved the drills. They're they're pretty elementary. It's pretty for a team that's struggling. They're not really getting any sort of discipline in practice. They're just running these continuous, you know, rush drills, couple of three on twos, maybe an in zone three on two battle. Like there's there's no there's no true compete. I think back to like when everybody talks about the Chara Bergeron days at Restusha Arena that these guys would be practicing harder than they were playing. And, and to me, like you're supposed to practice the way you play. And right now the Bruins are practicing the way they're playing because they're sucking. They're not having high intensity practices. In my opinion, humbly Scott, maybe you disagree and their play, their play has been piss poor as well. And I think practice starts, the coach might indicate the drills, but I think the intensity needs to start with the leaders and you don't, you don't see Charlie McAvoy or David Pasternak or Brad Marchand getting vocal all too often. Actually, for McAvoy and Pasternak, ever. They're never slamming their sticks, trying to get teammates going. They're never really setting the tone in practice. I don't like the leadership that I'm seeing out of those two, Brandon Carlo, and any other of these you know, um, young veterans, which I don't even know if they're young veterans anymore. They're just kind of like straight... <laughs> veterans marsh is an older veteran prime. call him in their prime yeah. martian i'll give him a pass because he's been there and he's done it and i think that and i just don't think he's the type of leader that you know the other it's tough for him to lead i think when he doesn't have his his his, his running mates and burrs Ron and char and Krejci and others i think he's having a tough time with these younger kids and i yeah, but i think he's the one with the personality to to yell and to but it can't be a one. It can't be a one man show. Like you, if you're wearing a letter on your jersey, if you're not wearing a letter, you can be a leader. But McAvoy and Pashnak wear letters. Carlo in the past wears a letter. Scott, I'm going to ask you first because because Bridget hasn't had the luxury of being at practice uh, often this year. Am I am I just seeing things or am I onto something here? No, you're you're not just seeing things. And I think what what really stands out to me is like as you're talking, I'm thinking about moments or or even practices that have stood out and th and what really stands out to me is like they're so infrequent and, and they're these one-offs that don't happen consistently like on their last road trip i think it was at, it was after the utah game it was the sunday practice in utah you know it was jim mcbride was there for the globe and reported that it was like a really vocal practice. And Montgomery said he was really proud of the way the leaders stepped up and like took charge and were really vocal that day. Okay. But then you don't see that for like the next five practices. And then you get a practice um, this week on Monday before the Toronto game where there was a ton of like banging their sticks and vocal and chatter and like, and like attaboys, like all it, it like it almost felt forced because it was so much louder than usual. And it was like, well, clearly there was this mandate or kind of team meeting in the room before where they were like, Hey, we're gonna be really loud today and like let's ramp up the energy. And it's like, okay, so you did that one day, and then you went out and beat Toronto, and then it disappears, and it's like it's just not happening. And like, there isn't consistently high and I, that that was, you know, last, last week, not like this past week. Um, but it's not like, it's just not consistent enough. It's just not happening often enough. 
And when it does happen, it, it stands out because it's infrequent. And like, yeah, like the battle stuff, it, I think their last practice before they went on the road this trip, Trent Frederick and Parker Weatherspoon mixed it up right at the end. But that was like literally the last drill. I'm trying to think of like other instances of that. And I'm like, in training camp, there was a practice where David Pasenak and Nikita Zadorov kind of went at it. But it's like, other than that, yeah, I can't really think of any times that that's happened. Um, and it's, and, and you know, and you have Montgomery again this past Wednesday, like laying into the team to pick up the pace, dropping F bombs left and right. Like, you know, like he's clearly frustrated and upset. And like, as you said, like they're doing fairly basic drills. This isn't, you know, wind sprints or like complicated stuff. It's, it's the same drills they always do and they're not doing it at the pace that he wants them to. So, um, yeah, you're right. It's, something's off and, and they don't seem to have no, they, they say the right things and they give off this air of like, we're confident we're going to figure it out, but then nothing's changing. And this is just piling up bad day after bad day. Yeah. And when, when you watch it in the game too, like not just in practice, like, a lot of times I feel like you used to see guys on the bench, like not even like not saying like that they're yelling or, or being like, Hey, play better. But like, there just seems like they're in the past was maybe more communication in the, in like key moments on the bench where like one guy's either trying to motivate someone or, or tell them like, you know, next shift, like what, what they want, like talking about like a Bergeron or a, a Felino on the bench, even Maroon when he was here um, being really vocal and, and, making sure people are, are present and, you know, not getting in their own heads and, and, you know, have a, a shared goal, what we're going to do next shift or, and what have you. But there's really, there's a few guys on the team that I still see doing it. And I mean, obviously this doesn't help all that much because he's in net, but like Jeremy Swimmon is one of those people that um, has the personality to, to be motivational uh, but most of that comes before the game because, or, or, you know, cause he's, he's not able to sit on the bench and talk to these guys cause he's, he's in goal most nights. So um, that's the kind of personality that they would, they kind of need more of on the team. I think, I don't know. Swayman's always pretty optimistic and usually one of the guys who keeps his head up and you see mm. like, maybe that's lacking right now for some of the other guys. Yeah, I mean, and unfortunately, he swimming he can't back check or forecheck. So, um, but, but yeah, I would just, just he would love to forecheck. He, he would love to. Chance. Yeah, he would love to. And 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 I would, I guarantee you, he wouldn't want to run a one three one. He'd want to run a two one two or something like that, and just get two 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 forwards on. Um, but just to, to put a button on that practice thing, I, I would say, I would say the the the. the in one word that I don't see at practice is intensity. Their practices lack intensity and and you can seldom tell the difference between a morning skate and a practice of theirs. Scott, you just said it. It's the same drills as a player. You know, you're not, that's just, that's so monotonous. And that's that, that is where I put the practice deficiencies on the coaching staff because to, to drive to the rink, every practice, knowing you're just going to do the same, you know, continuous two on one and three on twos and then do like one maybe one you know like five on five drill and just you know stretch it out it's like there's there's no keeping the players on their toes and there's no and 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 when i watch these practices it's almost like you you don't as a coach you don't want to give professional athletes too much credit because there's a sentiment like oh they're a professional athlete (laughs) what more can they learn about the sport a lot you can like you can always learn, and it's always you know dependent on the games in front of you and the games behind you. It's like there's not much coaching. <laughs> it's it's like it's just a couple of rush drills and like maybe like in this D zone coverage be here, but I, I don't know. I, I just don't. I, you practice the way you play, and right now that's what that's how the Bruins are. They're playing with the lack of intensity that you're seeing in their practices, and the practices are monotonous. They're the same. And uh, there's just no intensity. And, and that's why I'm very disappointed in their leadership. And and I don't view Charlie McAvoy and David Pashnak and Brendan Carlo as young kids. Like, they've been the Stanley, the Stanley Cup final. They've all been in the league for uh, at least a decade, McAvoy approaching a decade. Like, they're not kids. And I think, quite frankly, they're not showing much leadership. And David Pashnak scores goals. That's great. 
what leadership has Brandon Carlo and Charlie McAvoy shown in games so far this year? Anything? Has 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 Pashnak besides a couple of goals? Has Marsham besides a couple of pinball goals? In fact, he he showed a lack of temperament and composure at times. So, again, it starts with those guys. Zadorov, Lindholm, where's their fire to 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 you know impress a new team, new city, new fan base? Like make like make their value known. I, it, up and down the lineup, there's there's deficiency. But to me, guys, it starts with the leadership. I said it last episode. At least Hampus Lindholm uh, had a couple of moments last night, and I'm not talking about his. 21 second behind the net <laughs> that you tweeted uh, out that I tweeted out guys Hampus Lindholm collects the puck last night and, and I was genuine when I said at least he had a couple of good moments because he scored a goal um you know what I had two but the goal interference exact exactly um but he gets the puck behind the net last night and I counted it you can you can go on my Twitter and, and watch it he sits there flat footed behind the net Stick handling for 21 seconds. Hey, at least if you're there, you know, the puck's not in the back of your net. It's behind I, the net, but it's not in somebody, the net. <laughs> some, somebody, somebody said that to me as well, and I can't disagree. They're down. You're down six to two. You're stick handling the puck for 21 seconds behind the net. And then you finally decide because you want to get the puck off your stick before Christmas. So you pass it down to Justin Brazo who just gets completely lit up by Orloff and the puck goes down for maybe not an icing, but it's just like, and to me, that's just kind of like <laughs> encapsulated the Bruins so far this year. I think we've like, all like, given I, up I, at that I, point in the game. Yeah. It's like, I almost wonder, and Hampus Lindholm isn't this kind of player. So I don't think it was, but it, like, I almost wonder if it was like showing up his own teammates or like in a way, like, like, is anyone going to work to come back and get open and like, give me a passing option? type of thing like, like anyone anyone want to do any work here that's like fair. and again like i don't really think that's his style so i don't I, I don't know what he was doing honestly but like i don't know it yeah it was just take uh, the net and skate you're a great right. skater you know what i mean right. like yeah <laughs> come on um yeah i mean as far as like the brian you mentioned how like they're always doing the same drills and it's like you know why montgomery's do, doing that because he keeps talking about how they don't seem to trust each other. They don't seem to know where each other wants to be. Like, you know, that it has to start coming more naturally. And I'm sure in his mind, he thinks if we keep doing it in practice, eventually it should come naturally. But the problem is, is like, if you're not practicing that stuff at game speed with NHL game intensity, then it's not going to work in a game. Like, duh. Right. Like if you're going too slow, and during an NHL game, then that breakout pass that you always work on in practice isn't going to be there. Or that, you know, that they like to, uh, on zone entries, they like to pull up and hit a trailer. And it's like, well, if that trailer was caught way behind the play, then he's not going to be there. And then you're just pulling up and you're holding onto a puck and there's no passing lane, which seems like just about every Bruins zone entry this year. Um, we, we've seen them try plays that they do in practice that just aren't, they're in game like the backhanders from the wall in the defensive zone to the middle of the ice that get picked off and kept in the zone. They get you can do those in practice when you're going at 75% speed. You get an NHL game, the other team's forechecking, and like it's not there. Um, you know, I a couple games ago, Elias Lindholm, again, this comes from another practice drill where he's the top forward and he sets up at the offensive blue line, stretch pass. He immediately hits, knocks it back to someone coming with speed, and then they're going to enter the zone. A last time tried that in a game, and there was no one coming, and it just got picked off and taken the other way. And it's like, yeah, because you're not playing at a high enough speed. Like the reason guys aren't where they're supposed to be or where they think their teammates are going to be, it's not because they don't understand what they're doing in drills and practice. It's because the intensity isn't there. They're not playing at a high enough pace for those passing lanes to be open in a game. And it's also like it, it's affecting time, like timing because, okay, you drop it back and you expect somebody to be there at a certain time, like to come pick it up behind you if you're doing like a, a drop pass. But if you practiced it at 75% speed, you're, you know, 
you're probably passing it that great in the game when guys might not be there or maybe it's out it's into their skates instead of onto their stick because the timing's off i don't know it's all there it's all valid um i but, I, but also bridget like just on that point before we go forward like that drill they do in practice and that you see them try to do in games finding a trailer shouldn't be your primary play like that the the problem is the 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 philosophy the Bruins are trying to implement are plays that like they shouldn't be your first instinct because if you, you hockey is meant to go north you're supposed to go north and if you go north with the puck more often than not then that's when the pull ups can be effective but if your pull up is the first thing you're trying to do there's no deception to your game so opponents just yeah. aren't fooled well, by it. it and like in fairness, like they, I, I probably exaggerate. Like they do do other entry drills, and they, they try to do have other ways to attack the net. But it, it all like pulling up becomes, it becomes the default option when there's no one with you because you're not, as a team, you're not getting out on the attack with speed. So if it's only one guy out there, like unless he's beating a defender one on one, he's gonna pull up and wait for teammates, and then like it. To, you're right. Like it's it's all just too slow because, yeah. Ideally, you have two forwards going, and one of them drives the net, and you try to make something happen. But like they just don't have two forwards up. Be, they but they could also they could also try to maybe do a, you know, some type of chip or something to just get it behind the D. Like last night, Pashnak had a turnover at the offensive blue line, um, trying to do like a pass between someone's legs, and like I went back and watched it a few times, and it's like he could all he had to do was just just chip it by the defense it, it was it was the uh sebastian aho uh opportunity in the first like four minutes when he came down the left wing side Pashnak had the it that's how quick it happens guys Pashnak has the puck in the offensive zone and then four seconds later it's a it's a breakaway for aho because he didn't get the puck deep he tried getting fancy at the top of the zones like it's just they're not making um a high percentage plays they're they're not they're just not and, and that just comes down to hockey smarts and that's a combination of, you know, coaching, lack of confidence, and lack of execution. And, Scott, you mentioned to me, like, um, it's a travel day. Um, they're, they stayed overnight last night, right, in Carolina, and they're coming back home this morning? Or did they leave? No, no, last no. They, they, they flew to Philly last night after the game. They're in Philly today. Yep. So, point the point I was getting to was their practice usually is in the morning, but it's not. So like a lot of times practice is at 11 o'clock or something like that. But you mentioned to me that it was at 1 p.m. today. And I just keep refreshing my phone to try to see if anything happened in the meantime, because um, we had one coach get fired immediately following our recording or during our recording uh, of a podcast few few years ago. And Bruce Cassidy got fired. And I'm just like, keep keep looking because... Scott, before we get on, you said, like, if you were to get fired today, it would probably be before practice, right? Like, I mean, that, that'd that be my guess. Like, I, I don't have any inside info on this, but I would, I would think, you know, you have a full practice on Friday before playing the Flyers on Saturday. Presumably, you, whoever is coaching the team Saturday is the guy you want coaching that practice on Friday. So I would think if Montgomery is still the coach Friday at practice, he at least has another game. Um, you know, I, I think if you're going to make a coaching change after Thursday night's disaster, like you'd make it before practice and you would have that coach run the practice. I, I would think. Yeah. And, and it's like the other coaches I'm get like, that's an internal solution for, it's not like they're going to hire a new coach today. If and, and, fired. So. And that's that's why I kind of wonder like how effective a coaching change would be because if they're, if you're just going to go internal to Joe Sacco or Jay Leach, it's like how different is their philosophy or approach than Jim Montgomery's? And and if the players are playing with a lack of intensity on the ice with those guys as your assistant coaches, are they just going to flip the switch with them as a head coach, even if it's an interim title? I don't know. I mean, maybe. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I will say like maybe Jay Leach has some different ideas because he just came back to the organization, right? Like he was in Seattle for a couple of years. Um, when he was here, he was head coach in Providence. He wasn't on the NHL staff. Sacco, yeah, absolutely fair to wonder like how much of that would change. Like he's 
he's been on staff the whole time Montgomery's been here and, and even before that. So um, I, you know, I, I would at least give Leach like the benefit of the doubt that he might have some different ideas and not just be, you know, the exact same stuff that Montgomery's doing, but, but, you know, I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe they brought him back because he's fully on board with Montgomery, like the way he's doing things. Who knows? And look, guys, I also think when you have Claude Julian as the Bruins coach for a decade, okay, and then Chara kind of goes away, and now the Bruins, are, you know, if Montgomery is fired, you're talking about having, you know, three head coaches in the in a span of whatever four four plus years, like. Um, you know, I, I think, I think the reason that Cl- one of the reasons Claude Julian's, I think the one of the reasons why a head coach may have a longer tenure is because you have strong leaders that can implement the, you know, your ways and, 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 and in a way coach their own players when need to. Um, and I, I think it's, 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 it's undeniable the leadership that was in Boston during the Claude Julian era whether it was early on in 07, 08, all the way through his last year. Um, and I believe, you know, uh, somewhere in, in 2016, maybe. But, um, and then Bruce Cassidy had Chara Bergeron. He lasted six years. Uh, I, I didn't love the idea of him getting fired. I thought he was a good coach, but the players tuned him out because they didn't like his, uh, his ways. And now Montgomery is, you know, he's lost a lot of leadership in the last, you know, year. I mean, don't forget, guys, last year, even though it was kind of like the Moneyball Bruins, you had a locker room with, uh, for the last half of the season, Pat Maroon. For the full season, Kevin Shattenkirk, James Van Riemsdyk. Like, you had you had some, you brought, they brought in some veterans last year to help with that leadership uh, void that was going away with Bergeron, Krejci, and others, Felino. So don't underestimate the lack of leadership that they lost last year because on paper, the talent might be better than last year, supposed to be. But in the leadership department, it's worsened. And, and I think that the lack of leadership is why you're seeing a team kind of implode right now. And I think Montgomery could be, could potentially be the fall guy for it. Not that he's not to blame and not that the system's not to blame. Again, they had one even strength shot through 34 minutes last night of hockey. We're not talking about a team that's been playing really well and had an off night. This team has sucked out of the gate and every single game they've stepped on the ice, they've had something to prove from the last game they played about getting better and every game they step on the ice, they get worse. So I don't know how after getting shut out to fight to Philly in Boston to nothing uh, and the Nashville game a week ago, the Dallas game on home ice, like one even strength shot over halfway through the game, six shots in total five on the power play. I mean, they're not, again, they're not even competitive. It's all, I, I feel like I'm watching like a, Swedish elite league team play in the NHL, try to play in the NHL right now. It's just, they look like they're in a different league than every, than all of their opponents C- from a competitive standpoint. I, and I, I, when you're talking just now, Brian, I was thinking like, you know, leaders helping Claude Julian stay there for a long. Well, think about the first year Montgomery was here. He looked, he literally won the Jack Adams. He was considered the best coach in hockey. And now we're not that far off from that. Like this is his third season. That was his first season. We're not very far into a third season. So, um, you know, he's only been here for two full seasons and you feel like everything has kind of changed because those leaders are gone. I mean, that, that leadership group the Bruins had in Montgomery's first season was unreal. And we've gone over it many times, so we don't really need to go through it again, but they had an abundance of leaders and veterans and personalities that were uh, you know, that knew what to say at the right times. And uh, that's just not what they have this year. So yeah, Which it definitely is- has made his job hard. I mean, there was times during Montgomery's first season where, where there was criticism that he wasn't really even coaching because he was letting Bergeron do it. And like, uh, you know, maybe that's why the playoff issues were what they were, but yeah, I mean, he pretty much didn't well, have to do all that much year one because everything was working perfectly. Obviously they end up with the best record in NHL history. Um, and that's just not the case this year. Well, and, it, and it's also a reminder of like just how much this stuff is usually on a razor's edge of going the other way, because yeah, we talk about Claude Julian's longevity, but it's like, there were rumors in like, 
to the 0910. I think they got to a slow start that his job was in jeopardy. Had they lost the, to the Canadians in the first round in 2011, yep. he was gone. Like mm-hmm. it, it, you're always, you're one bounce away. Like we all think if they lose to Toronto in game seven last year, Montgomery's gone then. And it's, you know, but it feels like you're now at another one of those moments where it's like, all right, even if Montgomery makes it through Friday and, and is the head coach for Saturday's game in Philly, it's like, well, what happens if that's another disaster? Or or what happens – or if they go out and blow them out and win 6 nothing, how many more days does that buy them? Like, now if they go on a winning streak, is he now safe? And, you know, this team never looks bad – like – we could look back on this. Like, again, say they do stick by him a little bit longer and this team finally wakes up. We could get to the end of the year and we're sitting there saying like, man, good good thing Don Sweeney had a little bit of patience and didn't fire him on that Friday after that Carolina game when we all thought he was going to. But he could decide now's the time or he could decide Saturday's the time if that game doesn't go well. Like, it, it feels like we're like right at that moment here where it's like, this, you know, like it could kind of happen at, at any moment. It could happen as soon as we're done recording, which often seems to happen for us. Hey, so. please just don't do it while Scott and I are at BU Michigan tonight because then Scott's going to have to leave and he's going to be all mad. He has to go right instead of watching BU. Yeah, I need, I need to figure out if I can like just hop right over into the press box if it happens during the game. Uh, Yeah, we can get you there. I think we can get <laughs> so, you there. Just don't have too many beers, you know, during. <laughs> so... So Scott, I'm you're just like drunkenly climbing over the edge of the press box. <laughs> just like, hey, guys, this is some BS right now. <laughs> so Scott, you, you're right about the coaching and and the the margin for um, error or, or getting between getting fired or, or 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 your job being salvaged. It can be uh, Andrew Raycroft razor thin. Um, but <laughs> that's usually about results. The process right now is, yeah, has why, been, you know what, why doesn't he have like a Gillette sponsorship? Like, why is he, he not should. in like Gillette commercials? Hmm. He should, but it's, it's, it's the process that is alarming to everybody. It's the lack of competitiveness. It's the, I mean, they can't string two, let alone three passes together. They're, they're not getting any threatening shots. The, the entire game is brutal. So, um, like, that's why, you know, it, it's in my opinion, it's, 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 I think coaches get too much blame when things go wrong. And I think they get too much credit when things go well. Like, for example, if the Bruins pull out of this, it's going to be because the players find a way. And I, and, and just like it's the players fault right now that they're, that they're playing this way. Like I, I, I am looking square. I've said it already, but I'm going to say it again. I'm looking square at, at Pasternak, McAvoy, Coyle, Carlo. Um, you know, Marshan to an extent as well, but their, their leadership to me, I think has been, uh, I think it's an issue, um, or, you know, their so-called designated leadership. I think, I think McAvoy's body language in games in practices has been, has been pretty, pretty brutal. Like he, he, he looks like, he looks like he's like out there, like someone stole his lunch money, just kind of woe is me going through the motions. Um, not really, I'm not really seeing, you know, teammates really smiling or joking around together not that the games are going all too well but like there just doesn't seem to be a lot of camaraderie right now uh it just looks like a bunch of guys with bruins practice jerseys on and in the game it looks like guys with bruins game jerseys on and 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 i I have to put that on the leaders i have to because i just it starts with them when the goalie hugs left you know that that totally killed the vibe i was you know they were having fun always at least the goalies. It was a lot more fun for for pretty much every Bruins fan when uh, the goal when you get to see the goalie hug because you know they only do it when they win, and uh, it meant you had two good goalies, so you're winning more often. But uh, as I was gonna say, speak, speaking of goalies, like now feels like a good time to to pivot to Swayman and mm-hmm. just what we think of him. And, and I'll start by saying like. All right, he gives up six goals on 22 shots against Carolina. Obviously not good enough. Um, you know, n- don't think any of them were really his fault. There were obviously tons of breakdowns in front of him, but I made this point before, and here's what I'll say again is 
elite NHL goalies do not just make the saves they're quote unquote supposed to make. You have to make saves you're quote unquote not supposed to make. You have to take goals back. You have to bail your team out. And that is just not happening nearly enough with Jeremy Swayman this season. And maybe, maybe he's still working his way back up after missing all the training camp, but he is getting paid to be one of the very best goalies in the world. He has shown in the past that he can be that. Uh, and he hasn't been so far. He faced, according to natural stature, he faced seven high danger shots on Thursday night. Four of them went in. There are 58 goalies who have played at least three games this season. He ranks 55th in high danger save percentage. So basically, you know, how many uh, of the high quality shots that you're facing, and he is facing more of them than, than most, fair, but what percentage are, of them are you actually saving? Are you essentially taking back and making a save on a great chance? And he's doing that at way too low of a, of a level. He's well, been about- very He's been very good at that before. Like past seasons, he's had very good high danger save percentage. So what I would say to people is like, it's you're letting Swayman off the hook if you just say, well, look at the breakdowns in front of him. It's not his fault. Like, yes, there's some truth to that, but you need him to bail the team out more than he has. And Scott, I don't mean to throw you on the spot and we'll give you a second to Google this if you don't have it up, but what's his goal saved above expected numbers? Another advanced stat that kind of lets you know whether or not he's making those uh, quote unquote saves that he shouldn't make or that, an elite goalie wouldn't make. Well, we'll talk while Scott looks that up because I I just sprung that on him last minute. But, I mean, if I remember correctly, the Bruins' numbers in that category the last two seasons were really good. They were making a lot of – saving a lot of goals above expected, which is obviously – some of those numbers and and the high danger chances, like a lot of that, in my opinion, is is a little bit objective, like – uh, or subjective, I should say, because not all high danger chances are created equal. And uh, so uh, just even thinking back to the Carolina game, like some of those he had no, there's no way. <laughs> there was no way. So uh, but- sa- same sample size, 58 goalies who have played at least three games. Jeremy Swayman is 44th in goal saved above expected. He's in the minus, minus 2.2. So again, based on that statistic, he has actually given up more goals than would be expected from a league average goalie. So the the whole Swayman thing, I think is interesting because, uh, you know, hindsight is 2020 and a month ago, not even, um, we were talking about, you got to get him signed before the regular season starts. Um, because, we saw some not so great play in a small sample size from Corpus Solo and, and Bussy in the preseason. And we're like, Oh, well, you know, Bruins got to get up to a good start. Like it, it, you, you, you don't want to go two months without swimming because who knows what that record could look like. So they sign him and they sign him to a deal that both the player probably wanted the more and the team wanted to pay a little less, but in any event, had Swayman held out or the Bruins held out on Swayman until December 1st, there's uh, a sure certainty that they would have gotten him for a cheaper uh, annual average than uh, they probably paid him. So I guess what I'm trying to say is he did sign and he's three and he's three and five with a goals against average of what? Um, three, three, five, seven, save percentage of eight, eight, four. I mean, it's again, I, I mentioned hindsight in the beginning because, you know, everybody would have done the same thing. But, uh, well, maybe not everybody. There were probably some that were saying, wait out till December, hold them out. And uh, I, I guess e- even in this situation, it's backfired on the Bruins. Like they signed the guy and then he's given them goaltending that they were just the opposite of what they were thought they were getting. And Here, here's the thing I disagree. I, I think this Bruins team could have no wins this season if like I feel like this Bruins team could 
really be even a, in a bigger hole uh, if Swayman wasn't if, around. If they, were so. 0, if they were 0 and 11 with Corpus Allo or Bussy, and I'll be sending you and Scott down to TD Garden to play a game in that. <laughs> That's what I think could have happened. Like, uh, to be honest with you, after watching Corpus Allo's first game, I was like, he's oh, been, they, they would have been good. like, they, there would have been no hope. I mean, he was but, he was great against the Flyers. We we didn't really talk about that too too much. Yeah, but. yeah, that was a, a redeeming game for him, which obviously they still lost, but uh, was not his fault. He only gave up one goal. It was a two nothing loss because one was an empty netter. But yeah, he looked better in that game. But point stands like this might not be a playoff team this year. Uh, probably too early to judge that still. But it certainly wouldn't have been if Swayman wasn't in that. And you would have been getting to that Thanksgiving uh, non-official like barometer of whether or not you were going to make the playoffs or not. And you would have probably been like, oh, yeah, no, there's no way. If, if uh, I assume the record would be worse under, under Corpus Allo, just like common sense, I think. And then maybe you're paying Swayman more than you want, more than you had to because you're trying to get him back in the lineup after a month of the season that goes south like it has gone so who knows well we're just uh living in an alternate reality if we're, if we're trying to uh, decide what might have happened in that case but, but this but this the sentiment though is that you know they signed them looking to avoid the start that they've gotten they've gotten yeah. it anyway you know, to your a- point it could maybe, maybe it would be maybe it'd be even worse yeah but i think it would be four six and one is uh pretty yeah. sure it couldn't ha- it, it couldn't be better like and it could only be worse so yeah and speaking of so we haven't really gone into this but speaking of the off season in hindsight because i've heard this on radio like people now getting on sweeney saying like he botched the off season that the lindholm and zadorov signings already don't look good which is is hard to argue against but do you got are you guys at a point where you're second guessing the offseason? I think we all liked it. I think we all thought they addressed needs and you know we thought they were going to be like better built come the spring. But are we you having are, the playoffs first? Yeah, are, are you guys having are you guys having any doubts? Like, do you think they just picked the wrong direction this summer? Um, I mean, there was a lot of like there was a lot that they could have done. I I think that they made the logical moves, right? Like there's no arguing that trying to get a guy that was good at face-offs and can be on your top power play unit and was going to fill a top center role was something that you needed. Like, that was logical. And he was the best available. Now, does that mean he was necessarily one of the best in the league? No, but he was that – you didn't have a lot of options. Like he was the best option in Elias Lindholm and Zadorov, you're, you're building your team to try to brace for the Panthers, it, which always feels like an inevitable playoff matchup now. And so far it hasn't panned out, but I don't think, I mean, they were tied to some other guys, but are there, are there other guys, Scott, that you're thinking, Oh, you know, too bad they didn't get Stamkos instead or Getzel or like, it just felt like, first of all, price point for some of those guys was too high and uh, the needs that they wanted to fill the two guys that they got really worked in that sense. And I think another off season move that they made was they traded all Mark and they kept Swayman. And I know there was some people, not, not a majority of people, but some people that were like, well, maybe you got rid of the wrong goalie. Um, so it was another off season move that I don't know if people are second guessing. I personally wouldn't. Um, but yeah. It's it's tough because you have a you have a lot of factions of Bruins fans who will say, you know, they should have blown it up after the 2019 uh, Cup Finals or after. Look, I mean, they literally had the best record in league history in 22 23, and they didn't collapse because the roster sucked. They collapsed because, well, there's for a lot of reasons they collapsed, but I'm not going to go into it right now. Um, and there were injury issues, lack of chemistry, and and yeah, I I don't think they were mentally prepared for that team. But it wasn't because the roster wasn't capable. Um, and then last year, like last year, I think was the year where without Bergeron and Krejci, 
you could have made the argument to me that they should have they should have willfully taken a step back. Um, and I honestly think they would have been okay with that because they well, first of all, they had no money to get anybody, but they they went into the season with Coyle and Zaka as their top two centers. I've said it all along; they completely overachieved last year. I'm not if you gave the Bruins some truth serum, uh, Don Sweeney and Cam Neely, they knew that they weren't winning a cup last year, and they probably you know. I I don't think they expected to to be where they where they got to. Um, maybe last year could have been the year to just like not put any money in the team because they had no money to spend. But as far as this off season, I mean, what were they supposed to do? Like, you had money to spend. I, I'm I'm sorry, and, and even what we're watching right now, there are so many Bruins pessimists out there, so called Bruins fans that like they could win the Stanley Cup and they'd find something wrong with it. So I really question the fandom part of it, but certainly fans around the league, they are taking a massive victory lap right now over the demise of the Boston Bruins. And it's like, okay, I'm sorry, but there, if anybody thinks that unless something just really goes you know, wrong and the players just completely check out, there should never be a, a, a lottery team that has Jeremy Swayman in that Charlie McAvoy in the back end, David Pashnak up front as your three pillars in each position. Um, now, they're all playing like garbage so far this year, in my opinion. But even beyond them, this roster is too good to be a. Uh, it, it was too good before the offseason acquisitions to be a, a basement team. So, I, it, to, if you're a fan that wanted them to 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 be a, a basement team, like they don't, their their core heading into this year and as we speak is still, in my opinion, too good to be that team. So you're gonna, you so, so in other words, you're going to you're gonna spend to make that team better. And if that means that they're going to be perpetually, you know, mediocre, always close, but never good enough. And that's what some Bruins fans hate about the Bruins, fine. But I'm just telling you, that's that's what they were going to do. And that's what they did. So I don't know if there's anything differently they could have done this year. You could hate Don Sweeney all you want and, and look at his last 10 years as GM and dissect every move left and right. I'm not going to do that right now. Um, if we're talking about just last off season, Yeah, I don't really think there's much more you could change. I mean, Zadorov coming in. Guys, that was supposed to, the, the blue line was supposed to be an absolute force. They are the softest blue line and they're the biggest one. Zadorov is setting no tone for what he was supposed to be doing. And I, Scott, you warned people before the season, don't expect you know anything crazy from him, but we should be expecting a little bit more than what we've seen from him. Um, but Carlo is incredible. Looks for his size and reach and, and, and space he can cover, he looks far too easy to play against. I don't know what planet McAvoy is on. Lorai, yeah, on paper he might be six five. He plays like he's five five with with as far as physicality goes. Peak's been okay, but what's there to expect? Absolute, absolute brutal lost battle. Oh my god! Lorai last night. To- I mean, seriously, it's insane, guys. Like the size between us, Adorov, Lindholm, Carlo, and McAvoy and Peak. Why are they so easy to play against and knock off the puck? Well, yeah, we yeah. came into the season saying that was their strength, and it certainly hasn't looked like their strength. I mean, not that anything in particular has, has looked like a strength this so far. I would so like is, that to, on, is that on Sweden uh, again, or is that on the players? It's, it's, yeah, the it's players. it's not it's not playing with intensity. You lose battles when you're not playing with intensity, and they in any part of their game they do not have it. Um, you know, j- just to answer my own question, like I'm not at the point yet where I'm saying their off season was a bust. I do think I more people more than most that there were there was some risk in both of these signings and you're seeing some of the risk here like you know we, i think i even asked him one episode like what if elias lindholm and david Postnock don't click mm. well you're seeing that right now that doesn't mean they never will it means they haven't yet through 11 games um you know as i said like i said zadorov's gonna have some hiccups it's not gonna be smooth all the time um so yeah, not a great start, you know. I, but Bridget and both of you guys, like you're right. It's like okay, so what else did you want to do? You want to keep Jake DeBrusque? He has zero goals in Vancouver. Ask Canucks fans if they're happy about that contract right now. Stephen Stephen Samkins is doing diddly poo in Nashville. He's been terrible. Like he's not a five on five play driver anymore. So that wouldn't fix the Bruins' issues. Maybe you'd have a couple more power play goals. Um, the one big signing that is really working is Jake Gensel, who is lighting it up in Tampa. Yeah, so and he maybe, was probably the biggest get the offseason, and the Bruins couldn't afford him because everybody well, wanted him. 
you you could have you could have gotten Gensel and signed neither Lindholm nor Zadorov. Now you would still have huge question marks at center, but I guess the the question there and the approach you would be trying is can you load up on the wings so much that you don't need a number one center? I don't know. I find me the cup contender that won that way. Um, I don't or know if it like, exists, but or could Zaka elevate you or you know what I mean? Like could Zaka take on uh I mean you know, I think you saw in the playoffs last year, like he's not ready for it. So yeah. so let me let me ask this then, guys, because we've talked about we've talked about uh one potential change, right? We know it's the easiest one. It's for Don Sweeney to fire the coach. It's tail as old as time. If this but, can- by the way, but before we go any further, sorry, just to uh because we talked about it at the top. Don't know if this means anything, but Bruins practice for Friday has been called off. They net they have net, they now have nothing on the schedule for Friday. Mm. Hmm. All right. So not much different than their actual practices because there wasn't much going on there either. Um so what do you think today would be the the day you want to, like, I don't know. So th- this kind of brings up another thing to me. So, uh, you know, far be it for me to give too much credit to Mike Milbury, but he was on the Great Hill Show, made his weekly appearance on Thursday, and he brought up, like, it, either this team is, is actually just too slow or he brought up, like, is their conditioning not where it needs to be? Like, is this team somehow not in shape? And... You know, when when you start calling off practices, again, unless there's something else happening where the front office has intervened and said, guys, we're not practicing today. You know, generally you you call off a practice because either A, it was like maybe 50-50 whether you were going to practice anyways, the team has a great win and you reward them with a day off. We know that's not what happens. So the other reason to call it off is you think your team is just too tired. And you think like... The, having a day off is that is going to be more beneficial than being on the ice. They like so. I'm trying to think. So they've been on the ice every day this week. Their last off day was Sunday, but like, I wouldn't. You shouldn't really be too tired. Now you you do have a back to back coming up Saturday and Sunday, but yeah, I don't know. Like it's it's definitely interesting at least. I think they're trying to give him a mental a mental break right now. I'm not saying they deserve it, but I think they're trying to give them a day off mentally um, and come back to Boston with a clear mind. And look, uh, the conditioning thing, and, and maybe, maybe they're maybe they're running the Rocky steps instead. Oh, well, hopefully, the conditioning thing. Maybe I missed a couple of uh, of practices or sessions or drills, but in training camp, I didn't. You know, I saw Brad Marchand skating before a main group one time doing wind sprints. Um, because he was coming back from, from surgery and stuff was trying to catch up to speed. I didn't see many, uh, you know, intense skating drills f- for the purpose of conditioning and training camp. Maybe they were there. I just maybe not, may not have seen them, but I can tell you in practice, they're not going to look, they're not going to get on the line and do Herbie's and pregame skates. I know that, but, and I know the NHL schedule is very condensed. So you're playing games every other day. So if you, if you have an off day practice, you know, is it really worth skating them and getting their legs dead for the following day? I, like I get it, the schedule presents challenges, um, but I can tell you guys, and Scott knows the, the the practices are not are not the skating intensity and conditioning is not the focal point at all. So, uh, and that that is on coaching. The co- like the players dictate like the the intensity of how they approach drills, but again, the coaching staff, in my opinion, has not presented enough uh, challenging practices, in, in, in my opinion, um, but. We talked about the coaching change uh, potentially on the horizon if things don't change. Two-part question. Are there any main roster pieces and potential key pieces that you would consider trading from the roster if this continues for, call it, another couple of weeks or whatever or month? And then it gets kind of dicey. Okay, what players have no moves, no trades, blah, blah, blah. And also what other teams even want the Bruins plays right now. So, um, but just conceptually, if this continues for insert time and you guys can be the judge of that, would you consider moving potential, a a core piece or a roster player or two just 
on its on face value. We don't have to get into the nitty gritty of the details, but just would you be willing to? Well, I was, I was actually like, because obviously we're winding down towards the end of the podcast, but I was actually thinking of like ending on a positive note. Like, I just don't think that this team is as bad as they're playing. Like, I think that the pieces that they have that have been playing bad, like that can't be what they are the whole year, right? Like that just can't, like I, I still refuse to believe that the guys on this team, like Pasternak and McAvoy and uh, you know, different guys on different nights. Uh, I, I refuse to believe that, that they're, that's just who they are this year. Cause that's not who they've been. So I was actually going to go the other way, Brian, I'm sorry not to answer your question, but I just feel like it's too, it's too early to say. And, and that's not a cop out. Like I'm not saying that because it's only a month into the season. I'm saying that because the guys have done it before and they're not they're not as bad as what they look like right now. And I think even Swyman could do that, like has that gear that we've seen him get to that's better. I think most of these guys have it in them to get back to the way that they've been. Like it's it's been a bad month. There's no doubt about it. But uh, they're not going to – this isn't the rest of the season. Like I don't see this being the rest of their but, season. And I still think like – I don't think we're going to be sitting around going like, oh, you know – uh, are they going to be, you know, like hopefully by the trade deadline, they're rating right it again. Like, and you're not like, Oh, are they going to be sellers? Like, who are they going to sell? Like, I'm not thinking about selling and I'm, I'm don't really want to name a player that I'd be okay with getting rid of right now. Just because but, like, I still feel like they, they, but to clarify either a coaching change or start playing better. And at that point, the, the, it becomes moot for a little bit anyway because you're trying to see if the new coach can spark something. You're trying to see if they – or if they yeah. actually start winning to see if, if things start clicking. So, I don't know. I'm not quite there yet. And that's that's fair. But just to clarify, I'm not suggesting a, 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 a trade just to sell. Uh, it would have to be yeah, like a hockey trade like, to shake things up. Yeah. And, and I, look, I think if you look at recent examples of teams that had promise that got off to really bad starts and needed something to change things up, I'm not saying th this Bruins team are these teams because they accomplished the ultimate goal or came close to it. But if you look at the 2019 St. Louis Blues, they had a coaching change midway through the season. They had a goaltender who came on that was new. That was kind of a personnel change in Jordan Bennington. And you had Robert Bertuzzo drop the gloves with Zach Sanford in practice and tune them up pretty good. I don't see any Bruins players being willing to, to fight each other in practice. I know Frederick and Wotherspoon did give each other little face washes, but that wasn't an actual fight. And I'm not saying that they have to do that. I'm just saying, like, does the does this Bruins team have that? Do they have the balls to even do something like that in practice? I don't know. But that there was a coaching change there, and let's call it what it was, a goaltending change. Um, the Oilers last year got off to a rancid start, but you had two of the best players in the world. They had a coaching change. They turned it around. I think the closest comparison you can make would be the Florida Panthers from uh, 2022, 2023. If you remember correctly, Paul Maurice around the midseason mark was screaming at them on the bench and um, they were not playing with the intensity that they needed to play with. It was far from the Florida Panthers we've seen in the last uh, you know little while since then. Um, uh, well, who, who am I and even up? before then, too, like Keith, were... Keith Kachuk, Keith Kachuk, uh, like publicly criticized the Panthers said that they, their work ethic sucked, whatever. And that Panthers team, I don't think had any personnel changes and they kind of just like turned things around, um, battled for the second half of the season to even make the playoffs, which we all know that's why they were playing with that playoff intensity and beat the Bruins around one. They go to the cup finals, they lose and the following year they do their thing. But what, that Panthers team is the best example I can think of where they had a slow start, but had no coaching change or major personnel changes and just, figured it out but yeah know, but you know the, obviously the big difference there is that was paul maurice in his first year as florida panthers head coach right not on an expiring contract without an extension in place like mm -hmm. so that Fair. that's where you know making the change is it's just you just can't ignore the possibility like it, it's it's there if if don sweeney had unwavering faith that jim montgomery was the the right coach for this team, he would have been signed to an extension before the season. So like he's already told us without saying it publicly that he has doubts at least. And so like, how would those doubts not be growing 
at four, six, and one, having lost mm. five of the last six games and playing as poorly as they are. Um, and that Panthers so, team had more talent too, to be fair. Than, than this Bruins team, I think they had probably more talent, I mean, at least in retrospect, because since then, Reinhardt's gone on to be a you know 50 plus goal scorer and you know they're all but but your point is is valid scott that's that's a big distinction yeah and so to to circle back to your question like i i would not right now be looking at as big of a shakeup as trading like a true core piece like a team leader type of player i think if this season really goes south then anything should be on the table um i would be open to a smaller shakeup you know trade away and i'm i'm not going to name names because like it's just not fair but pretty much everyone like outside of your captains essentially like trade one of those guys who's you know liked in the room but not performing up to expectations right now you know again if there's a hockey trade out there to be had like you just change change the makeup a little bit i, I think something like that should be on the table i'm not saying you have to do it. And I'm definitely not saying take, you know, less than fair value for someone, but um, yeah, I think if you're Don Sweeney, like you're, you're poking around, we, we've at least, we've seen a couple trades get made already this NHL season. It's, it's uncommon. Like this isn't usually when you make trades, but it's also not unheard of. I don't think Tyler Johnson is fixing the problems that they have. I don't think he's adding to it though. And I think I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if they sign him guys, like honestly, they need anything right now. Positive. If they sign him and he goes into a game and finds a way to get a power play goal or just makes that third line move better. Like why, why, what's the, what's the hesitation here to do something at all? Yeah. And th- this is where like pressure has to be building on Don Sweeney is like, how, how have you not altered the roster at all yet? And take trade out of it, but whether it's signing Johnson or calling someone out up, like how have you not at least tried something to just inject a spark in from outside the current group? Like that. Yeah, all they've done is continue someone down. Yeah, like that continues to just not make any sense to me. Yeah, like we thought maybe Tufty down means someone else up or, or signing Johnson, but like it was just sending Tufty down. And then there was no corresponding move. It's been a while since that happened too. So it's not like, you know, they, they they didn't have time to do it and, or reason to do it because there's been plenty of reason right along now for the past several games uh, to do something. So. All right. I'm actually surprised we talked so much about a game like that. Um, It was more of like a, it ended up being more of a like season on a whole kind of forward looking how many times can we talk about the, uh, you know, the inefficiencies of their even strength play and five on five and break it down? It's it's the same shit, different day. So, um, you know, I'll speak for myself. I'm sick of talking about it. I, I'd like to talk about some encouraging plays and some exciting hockey. I mean, the product right now is so boring and, and honestly, like painful to watch. So maybe they'll go 10 and 0 in uh, November, guys. Um, but it starts with one one win, right? So we'll, we'll follow it. And by the way, we mentioned this last episode, but we we are going to try to do a, a mailbag, uh, maybe next week or certainly the week after, so people can can send in questions. It it won't be Monday's episode because we'll be reacting to two games over the weekend. But um, tweet us at the skate pod, email skatepod at wei dot com, or uh, leave us a comment on YouTube. All right. Um, with that in mind, Bridges Scott, anything uh, left to talk about here? Are we good to go? No, I think we're good. All righty. Thank you all for listening. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, and we'll talk to you on Monday. Hey, guys, thanks for watching this gay podcast. If you want to see more of our videos, visit our playlist. Not in front of a screen? You can listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to follow us on social media. And if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give us a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and leave a comment. Thank you.